Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Cross Community Church. We are almost at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's been like months we've been walking through this. And as Jesus is concluding his inaugural sermon, the first sermon he ever preached, uh, he's begun warning us about a few things. Now, I need to tell you a story. If you haven't been around here very long, you may not know this about me, but when I was a kid, I had some sleep issues. Uh, As a matter of fact, one time we were on a mission trip, Mexico mission trip, um, I, I woke up one morning and it was, it was really odd because as the, my eyes began, began to adjust to the light and I, I start to have clarity in my sight, there's a guy like staring at me and I'm like, why are you staring at me? You know, I just woke up. What's, what's going on here? But uh, as time passed and I began, began to see more clearly, I, I, I realized that I didn't know this guy. So here's a guy in my room that I don't know staring at me. Now, it was one of those old school dormitory, concrete floor, cinder block wall kind of places. Um, and again, as my eyes continued to be able to focus and see a little bit more clearly, I realized that not only is some random guy I don't know staring at me while I'm on my bed, I don't know any of the guys in the room. And they're all starting to look at me a little bit strangely. And as I started to put the pieces of the puzzle together, I remembered the night before being up out of my bed and struggling to find where my bed was supposed to be. And I remember the sharpness of gravel on my feet and the need to find my bed once again. And I remember going in a specific room and thinking, oh, here it is, only to find some guy in my bed. What had happened, unbeknownst to me, is I had been sleepwalking and went to sleep in the wrong dormitory with a group of guys that I had no clue who they were. I woke up uh, the next morning about half-dressed and super embarrassed. Like, I had to go eat breakfast with all those guys, like, the next morning, and they're looking at me like, why were you in our room? Like, you're a weirdo. And, of course, all my friends gave me uh, quite the hard time about it. And I I tell you that story because, honestly, it was pretty embarrassing. I don't know how that would be for you. It was embarrassing for me, and I got uh, some flack from my friends. It's been a number of years, and people still make fun of me uh, for that. But there's a more important scenario for you and I that isn't quite so lighthearted. It's a similar scenario where one day we might wake up, and having ignored the warning signs, find ourselves, much like me, in a place that we don't want to be. The trouble with the scenario that I'm going to tell you about today is that there's no going back. At that point, it will be too late. Today, Jesus, in his third warning at the end of his sermon, is going to talk to us about the day of judgment. When we stand before God, and the question for you today is, are you going to hear something along the lines of, uh, welcome, enter, welcome into my joy, or are you going to hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. We're going to be looking at one of the most um, difficult texts in terms like it should make us tremble. One of the most terrifying texts in all of the New Testament. And yet I would argue uh, that it should also be one of the most encouraging for for those of us who are in the faith. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to begin in verse 21. Here is what Jesus said to the people that he's been preaching to for some time. They've been listening to this whole sermon all at once. He's gone up on the mountain. He's teaching the people. He's taught them about life in the kingdom, about what it looks like to live as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven while Cyril still here on this earth. And he turns his attention toward the people. And he says this. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And he goes on. Many, here's that word again, many will say to me on that day, this is the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Now, it's at this point you would expect Jesus to be like, oh, yeah, 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 I forgot about all that you've done. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, come on in. But you know what Jesus says to people that had cast out demons, prophesied in Jesus' name, worked miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Jesus paints a scenario 
in which we could walk through our entire lives as asleep, not paying attention to the warning signs along the way, and one day stand before God believing that we'd done everything that it took to be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven, only to hear the words depart. You see, the fact that Jesus is even including this in the Sermon on the Mount, suggests that there were people who had sat there listening to his sermon on that day. They'd heard his teaching about life in the kingdom. They'd heard all the stuff. But they were in danger of hearing the teachings of Jesus and then walking away and ignoring everything he'd commanded them to do. They were in danger of hearing about the kingdom of God and walking away with hearts that continue to be full of lust and adultery with hearts that continue to be full of bitterness and anger and unforgiveness, continue to live lives where they're just pursuing money and possessions and all the things that the world has to offer instead of seeking the kingdom of God. They were in danger of hearing all of the promises of Jesus, all the teaching he's given us thus far, and then walking away and living their lives as if Jesus hadn't said anything that he'd said to this moment. So Jesus is warning us. So far in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, hey, would you, would you just take a minute to think about which gate you've entered through? Would you stop for long enough to evaluate which path you're walking in this life? Would you look at the fruit of your life? Are you producing fruit of the Spirit in your life, or is it something else? And now in the third warning, he pushes us even further. He's telling us that we might be deceived, like there could be something present in our life that would make us think that we're on the path, we entered through the gate, bear on the fruit, when in reality that's not actually true, that we could be self-deceived and missing what we believe that we're headed toward. So Jesus is warning us here. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, who at first doubted him but ultimately came to faith in, in, in Christ, he became the leader of the church at Jerusalem. He said these words that I think add to or, or help clarify what Jesus is talking about here. In James chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, he says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Like there could be this thing that would happen with us. And listen, this, this is to the church today, right? That's, that's who I'm, I'm preaching to. That's who the word is being spoken to today. That we could do this thing where we come week in and week out and we hear the word of God. And maybe like some of the people in the time where Jesus was preaching this originally, we might nod our heads we might say our amens. We might finish the scriptures that Jesus was quoting. And then walk away, only hearing the word and never actually becoming doers. We might deceive ourselves into thinking, yeah, I'm on the path. Man, I'm, one, I'm a disciple. I'm following after God. I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do. And then one day find ourselves in a scenario where we hear the words depart. So how do we... Avoid deception. How do we know I'm in the faith? I'm a genuine believer in Jesus. I want to tell you that. But first, I want to point out some of the ways that we can deceive ourselves. As the church, as men and women who uh, are around religion, who are around Christianity, in this case, men and women who may be familiar with the Bible, here's a few of the ways that we can deceive ourselves. The first one is this, intellectualism. Intellectualism says, I know something, so I must be saved. I, I can quote the verses. I, I, can, I, I know how church is supposed to work. Man, I, I kind of know theology. I could win an argument with other people. I know something, so I must be saved. Look here in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord. They called Jesus Lord, which is what he rightfully is, isn't he? Like at the very least, this is an honor this is a title of honor. It's expressive of respect and reverence. It's a word that slaves would use for their master. And so there are men and women who on that day are going to stand and say, Hey, Lord, they're going to recognize his, his bigness, his greatness. They're going to call him Lord. And yet as we see in the text here, they're ultimately going to hear the words depart. I never knew you. Intellectualism says, I know the right things, so I must be saved. 
I can spout right doctrines, use the right phrases. I call people brother and shake hands with them in church every week. But we might be deceiving ourselves. James, the brother of Jesus again, James chapter 2, verse 19. He says, you believe that God is one. He's referencing Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It's known as the Jewish Shema. This is the John 3.16 of Judaism. The first verse you ever would have learned. It was, it was written on their doorposts. They had like posters and little uh, placards at Hobby Lobby that would have said this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. This was like the central framing of the faith for the Jewish people. And James says, oh, you know that? You believe our God is one? He says, you do well. But you need to know that the demons also know that. They also believe that Jesus is Lord. They may know better than you or I do. And they shudder. See, demons might know what you and I know. They might be able to quote the verses. They know that Jesus is Lord. They know something. They believe that Jesus is Lord, but they very clearly don't belong to Jesus. So the first warning, the first way we can deceive ourselves, believing that we know something, therefore we must be saved. The second way that we can deceive ourselves, kind of like intellectualism, I, I know something, therefore I must be saved, is emotionalism, which says, I feel something, therefore I must be saved. Save. Look at verse 21 again. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now, to, to double this up, like to say it twice like this, this was an emphatic expression. It was fervent. It was enthusiastic. It was a heartfelt address. Like, I'm not just calling, you are Lord. You are Lord. This was, this was they would have felt it. They're not like halfway doing it. Like, all right, Lord. You know how when you make your kids apologize to each other and they're like, sorry. You know, like they don't really give it much. This was like heartfelt calling Jesus Lord. They felt something when they said this. Their hearts were stirred a bit within them as they described him as Lord, convey, this conveys familiarity, would have been spoken affectionately. They would have talked about Jesus with this kind-hearted affection. Emotionalism says, I feel something, therefore I must be saved. I had a spiritual experience one time. When I was a kid at vacation Bible school, tears streamed down my face and walked an aisle. I went to church camp. Man, they were worshiping. I was raising my hands. I felt something. So I must be saved, right? Take you back to the passage in James. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. That word right there that says shudder is from the Greek word phariso. It's one of the most, it means to be struck with extreme emotion. It's one of the most emotive words in the Greek language. The demons feel something. They tremble before God. Even though they feel something, they don't have faith. So one of the ways we can deceive ourselves, saying, I know something, intellectualism, therefore I must be saved. The second way, I feel something, so I must be saved. That's, that's emotionalism. And the third way is that of activism. I've done something, so I must be saved. Did y'all hear verse 22? Did y'all hear the resume they just spouted? I mean, I, I can't hang with some of these people when it comes to what I've done in my life. Like, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Like, this isn't pretending. Like, they prophesied in the name of Jesus. They were casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And they were going around to hospitals. They're healing people in the name of Jesus, performing miraculous things in the name of Jesus. Like, man, I wish I could tell you I've done those things. But these people still heard the words, depart. I never knew you. They knew something felt something, they even did something. And they heard the words, depart. Mark chapter 6, 
Jesus gathers up his 12 disciples. He's like, hey, guys, you've been, you've been seeing me do some stuff. Like, man, I've been casting out demons. I've been healing the sick. Now, I'm going to give you guys authority. I want you to go do the same. So he sent them out two by two. And, man, they did it. Like, they started the same way, like casting out demons and healing the sick. Mark chapter 6, verse 13 says, They were casting out many demons. They were anointing many with, many, uh, with oil, many sick people, and they were healing them. And they come back to Jesus, and they're just celebrating like, man, look what we've done. We're casting out demons. They, were, they listened to us in the name of Jesus. There were people getting healed. It was this huge experience. Do you know who was in their midst on that day? A disciple named Judas. He was a false disciple. Casting out demons, healing the sick. He didn't know Jesus Christ as Lord. There's three ways I've talked to you about that we can deceive ourselves into thinking that we're in the faith, going through life kind of like having blinders on, maybe failing to recognize the warnings that we've been given along the way, that maybe we haven't entered through the gate, or maybe we're not walking the path, or maybe our life isn't bearing the fruit of that of a disciple. And how tragic would it be like these guys, to show up at the end and hear the words, depart. I never knew you. And so it's really important for us at this point not to just leave you here where maybe you're questioning, which Jesus would have wanted us to do, by the way. The warnings are there in order to point you toward the right things. But what is this text teaching us? Like, what do we do in response to the fact that we might be deceived? that we might have missed genuine faith. Like, what do we do? What's lacking in what we've heard and what do we need to do in order to ensure that we're in the faith? Jesus pointed to us in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, that's the one that's going to enter. He tells us that those who called them Lord, they knew some things, they felt some things, they did some things, they prophesied. In verse 23, he called them those who practice lawlessness. Now, these were Jews. It's not like they ignored the law, right? Lawlessness wasn't conformity to an external set of rules, but it was submission to the will of of the Father in their lives. It was hearing the word of God as Jesus would preach and he began to teach about life in the kingdom. They just didn't just hear it with their ears. It took root and it began to birth fruit in their hearts and in their lives. They became obedient to the teachings of Jesus. And so I want to ask you today to examine your life and say, have you submitted yourself to the will of the Father? I'm not talking about do you know some things or feel some things or even have you done some things. Is your life submitted to the will of the Father? Do you possess authentic faith? Now, I want to be really clear about something because this can kind of get twisted up a little bit and maybe mess up our understanding. When we stand before God, we are justified by faith alone. We are saved by grace through faith. And that faith is not even of yourselves. It's not by works, so no one can boast. It is a gift of God. When we stand before God, we're not going to give him, hey, I knew this, I felt this, or I, even I did this. We're going we're gonna to come to God and say, I had faith. When we stand before him, if he gave us the question, hey, why should I let you in? We would say, I have faith in Christ. That's our explanation. But I want to be really clear about something else. We are saved by faith alone, but genuine faith is never alone. Genuine faith would lead us to surrender our will to the will of the Father. We surrender to Him. And so here's my question for you today. Are you doing the will of the Father? I'm not talking about being a pretty good moral person, feeling some things or knowing some things. Are your decisions and actions and priorities a reflection of your will or of God's? Is the way that you're conducting yourself in your marriage or in your family or in your workplace or even in your thoughts, is that a reflection of God's will or of yours? The way that you would spend your time 
or the way that you would spend your money, is that a reflection of God's will or is it of yours? The way that you're pursuing things in this world, are you seeking first the kingdom of God or are you seeking first the kingdom of you? Are you living as if God is kind of some distant deity that you appeal to for salvation and forgiveness, but he really otherwise doesn't care all that much about how you live your life? Or do you see God as a loving father who day after day you come before him and you're saying, I want to deny myself and take up my cross and follow you today, Jesus, because I believe that you have the words of life. I believe that you have laid out what the abundant life looks for us here. I have surrendered my life to you, and I'm going to follow you every single moment of every single day. Do you treat Jesus a little bit like you used to your parents or maybe even your boss? It's easier to ask forgiveness than it is permission. Maybe you do some things. You know you probably aren't the best things, but you know God's going to forgive you. So you're not all that worried about it. I had a conversation with a guy uh, just about a week ago. He's talking to me, calls me, and life's not going so well. And I, I just pointed him, like, here's what the scriptures would tell you to do in this scenario. I know that's not what I'm going to do. Are you doing the will of the Father in your life? Have you surrendered yourself to Jesus? Is he really Lord? Or do you just know something, maybe feel something and do some other things? Or is he really Lord? Does he call the shots in your life? Is your life given in worship to a worthy Savior? As a pastor of this church, this has weighed heavily on me this week. I like to think that we could gather here every single week Go through all these motions, a lot of external religious activity, but not actually to truly know him as Lord, possess authentic faith. Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, and he gave them a warning. Here's what he said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. He said, Do not be deceived. Suggest that this was happening in the church, not outsiders in the world. But in the church, do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. The one who sows to his own flesh, the one who does his own will, follows after his own desires, makes his own priorities, sets his own agenda, the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. You can translate the same word differently, and it means hell. He goes on and says, But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he's been teaching us how to live as citizens of a new kingdom. We have the path to life in front of us. The question is, will we persist in hearing the word of God week in and week out and never becoming doers of the word in our lives. We'll be like the people that he might have been preaching to on this day. Heard the word, said the amen, knew, oh man, Jesus, he's teaching good stuff today. And he left there with hearts full of lust and bitterness and unforgiveness, hearts full of disobedience, trusting in what they knew or what they'd felt or even some of the things they'd done, and headed toward destruction. Now, here's the thing. Jesus didn't say these words to beat us up and beat us down and kind of, you know, we feel all heavy under the weight of guilt and condemnation. As a matter of fact, when Jesus begun his warnings here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he started with an invitation. He said, enter through the narrow gate, like start walking this narrow path that leads to life. Jesus loves you, and Jesus is the one who made the way. He died that we might find this path to life. Like he went to the cross with his heart full of love. He endured the cross and the shame and the pain there for you and I that we wouldn't live our lives being self-deceived, but instead we would live our lives as disciples that experience this abundant life that he has for us now and into eternity. 
Sometimes I think we, we underestimate how big the gap is between God and us. We underestimate just how holy and how righteous and how perfect God is. We underestimate just how sinful we are. We think, you know, I'm, I'm not that far away. I'm going to do some good things, kind of avoid some of the bad things. And I think maybe in the end God will say, it's all good. But there is a vast chasm between you and I and God. He is perfectly holy and righteous and just, and He cannot have fellowship with sin. If we've broken the law at any one point, we've broken the whole law. We are separated from God. But do you know who stepped in there? Jesus, who issued us these warnings that we might not be deceived, but that we might truly walk this path of life. Jesus went to the cross and bore our sin. He took our punishment. The wrath of God that we deserved was poured out on Jesus that our sins might be atoned for. He took our sin away that there's no longer a gap between us and God. But we can live the lives that we were created to live in fellowship with the Father. We can actually know Him. And we can walk with Him. And we can experience the abundant life that He has for us. But we'll never do that if we're deceived into thinking. I think I'm good. I've heard the word. I'm going to church, reading a little scripture. I know the words that I'm supposed to say, picking up some religious jargon, and I feel some things in worship. I've done some good things for God. If you're trusting in any of those things, you might be deceived. The question for you is, have you surrendered your life to the will of the Father? We surrender in three ways. The first is through confession. It's acknowledging that the way that we've been acting, the way that we've been pursuing our will, the areas of our lives where we say, no, God, not your will be done, but instead mine. We just confess that. God, I've been looking at things that I know are not appropriate. I know that are not honoring you. I know they lead to destruction. God, that's sin. God, I've been relating to my spouse in a way that I know is sin. God, I've been speaking to and about people in a way that I know is sin. God, I just want to acknowledge that. The word confession in the Greek, it's homilegeo. It just means to say the same thing, to call it what God calls it. It is sin. It's to acknowledge there's a gap here between God and me. 1 John, you can probably quote this. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess our sins before God, and He forgives it. Step one of surrender is confession. Step two is repentance. Repentance is turning from walking our own way, pursuing our own will, and instead it's turning, it's denying ourselves, taking up a cross, and following after Jesus. And this is the way I've been, I've been acting, the way I've been relating. God, I want to follow after you. Acts 17, 30, and 31, the writer Luke says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to to men that all people everywhere should repent, turn, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. If you believe in the resurrection, but you haven't repented, there's a real problem there. The resurrection was proof that he's God. And it was an invitation to repent of going your way and instead to begin to follow after Jesus, doing his will. And the final piece here is just beginning to walk in obedience. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you're sowing the seeds of righteousness. They're going to take root, begin to bear fruit in your life where you begin to experience the abundance of Christ. So today, maybe you're sitting here and you're convinced, like, I don't, I don't know Christ. Man, I've been trusting in what I knew or what I felt or even some of the things I've done to save me. But I'm not sure I've ever surrendered my life to the will of God. If that's you and you've never done that, today I want to invite you to be saved, to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, to ask God to fill your heart with faith. Confessing, repenting, and beginning to walk in obedience. But maybe if you're here today and you're a believer, you've been going your own way. 
the deceitfulness of sin. We've gotten off the path. Rather than walking the narrow path that leads to life, we're walking the broad path. The same invitation is for you today. Confess your sin, repent, and begin to walk in obedience. Would you bow with me? Father, we are truly thankful for your word, that you in your grace wouldn't allow us to settle for a life of religious activity. God, you were drawing us unto yourself because you love us. You're drawing us unto repentance that we might ultimately experience life through knowing you and being obedient to your will. So, Lord, for the men and women here, who maybe they don't know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that you might save them. This would be the day that they confess and repent and begin to walk in obedience. And, Lord, for those who do know you that might have been deceived, might have walked away from the path, God, I pray that today would be a day of confession and repentance and ultimately of obedience. And so, Lord, we've heard your word, and now we just want to respond, not being hearers, but doers of your word. And I pray for your grace in these moments. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.